tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. And to what do I owe this pleasure? Let me guess. Borrow a cup of sugar? Oh, shit. It's Friday already? Oh, well. No Barney Miller tonight. Come on in, friend. The deal's a deal. Mmm. There we go. So smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Because I've seen every Barney Miller episode a million times anyway. Damn it. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looked fun at first. They probably threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just $15 a month. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just $15 a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com drew. That's mintmobile.com drew. Cut your wireless bill to $15 a month at mintmobile.com drew. For our story tonight, we welcome back our good pal P.D. Williams. Or, to hell with P.D., we welcome back Craig and Lorna, who you might remember from Craig's Chair and Craig's Creature. We've got an epic installment in the series and an exciting announcement for you afterwards. So, without further delay, I give you, from author P.D. Williams, Craig's Demon. The air in the room was frigid and stank of rotten meat. The unearthly groans spewing from the small, spindly creature's mouth chilled Maddie to her core. The vile words it used to remind her of every mistake and shortcoming filled her with shame and sadness. Things worsened when it began pulling her dead mother's precious name into its swirling vortex of profanity and cruelty. There were no sacred cows here. The child-shaped monster jumped from the bed, horrifying and sickening Maddie, causing her to gasp as it fell three feet in front of her. She stifled her screams when its knees snapped in the opposite direction, its legs now resembling those of an animal. Its scalp was a hodgepodge of bloody patches where it had yanked out its hair. Raven eyes with scarlet irises glided forward with a muted squish. Please, don't let them pop out, Maddie thought. I'm sick enough as it is. Fear froze her, leaving her unable to flee, unable to defend herself. The disjointed ghoul crept toward her like a spider getting ready to feast on its struggling prey. With each step, the creature snapped its head toward a piece of furniture, willing it to fall over. The terrifying result made the whole room shake. The demon's jaws creaked as it opened its mouth wide enough to fit a football. It unleashed long, ear-splitting wails that fell somewhere between the howls of hell's tortured souls and a lunatic's laugh. Then it fell silent and smiled. Wanna see something scary? Mm -hmm. It asked Maddie. It clomped towards a bedroom wall, but instead of stopping, 
It walked up and across the ceiling where it hung upside down like an oversized bat. Maddie, Maddie, such a whore. Maddie, Maddie, bolt the door. Maddie broke free of her horror and scrambled to the hallway, slamming the door shut behind her. She secured the bolt she had installed when the thing first turned feral. Her pounded nerves pulsed, making her whole body quake. God help me. Please. Maddie struggled to accept that a week prior, the malevolent demon haunting her bedroom had been her nine-year-old son, Silas. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes in life you're faced with a crossroads and you're not sure which path to take. Like whether you ought to quit your electrician job and read scary stories for a living, for example. You know, stuff like that. Well, decisions do have consequences. So when you reach one of those inevitable crossroads, I've got a prudent word of advice. Talk to your therapist about it. And if you don't have one yet, you will in under 48 hours with our friends at BetterHelp. Career changes, relationship troubles, personal problems, we've all got things we need to talk out. Whatever stands before you at that proverbial crossroads, online therapy from BetterHelp can help you map out your future and trust yourself to find a way forward. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash darktales today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Dark Tales. Craig hated going to the grocery store and was glad of it. If he enjoyed going there, he'd visit more often, which would be terrible, because he hated going to the grocery store. Today's mission was a simple one. Strawberry Pop-Tarts for him and a box of Twat Stoppers for Lorna. He made sure he got the exact brand she demanded, otherwise she'd never let him forget it. She was still angry with him for giving away the ending to the movie Titanic. Craig was inches away from a clean getaway with his items when just before entering the express lane, a short, stumpy woman cut him off. She was a loathsome, half-witted hobbit who had somehow shoehorned her flabby body into a black Leonard Skinner t-shirt and a bulging pair of tiger-striped workout leotards. Excuse me, hun. I got youngins bacon in the truck. She said through neon pink lips that looked like the boys down at Gas Monkey Garage had painted on. The woman showed no consideration for Craig. To make matters worse, she had no regard for the universal supermarket rule of ten items or less in the express lane. She'd filled her cart with such culinary curiosities as Cheetos, Fritos, Doritos, Hilos, Lohos, Yohos, Fudgy Dingalings, and a six-pack of Diet Soda. Craig wondered at this point in the game if washing down a box of Little Debbies with a Diet Soda wasn't like tossing a sponge into the Atlantic. Come on, gal, start living la vida loca. Grab that two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew and chug, baby, chug, he thought. Adding insult to injury, Jabba the Nut was attempting to pay for her sugary treasure with a third-party post-dated out-of-state starter check drawn on the Bank of Tehran. The bride of Frankenberry finished her transaction and left, leaving Craig and others in line to ponder why lightning wasn't more selective. Craig was happy the worst was over. That is, until he saw the cashier. With a groan, he thought, Everyone, please remain seated, cause now that the opening act has primed the annoyance pump, it's time for tonight's headliner to take the stage. Let's give a big round of sound, kids, for Trudy, the surly cashier. Trudy represented the worst in cashierdom. She had been ringing up pork chops and dental floss for far too many years. The heroin soul-sucking journey was leaving her bitter, tired, and broken. Every customer she encountered was like a yammering half-wit to her. 
someone who'd squabble over an expired three-cent coupon on a can of creamed corn. Craig's experience as a battle-worn shopper made him aware that this was the precise moment when Trudy would adopt the role of an army field interrogator. Captured Syrian insurgents don't undergo the kind of grilling I'm about to endure, thought Craig. In a monotone, rapid-fire manner, Trudy's questions started flying around like hamsters caught in a Kenmore spin cycle. Do you have your store card? Do you want paper or plastic? Did you find everything okay? Do you have any coupons? Or are you eligible for a student or senior citizen's discount? Will this be cash, check, credit, or debit? Would you like help loading your groceries, sir? Unable to answer that fast, Craig felt underprepared and a little intimidated, so he had to give the question some thought. If he were being honest, most of them were reasonable, except for two. Did you find everything okay, and would you like help loading your groceries? Craig responded to the first one. Well, let's see. I only have two items here. First, I found this one, and then I found that one. So, yes, I'm quite comfortable stating for the official record that I indeed find everything okay. As for needing help loading my purchases, let's give them a looky-loo, shall we? Hmm, I have two items that I can fit easily into my glove box. In the words of Toby Keith, I ain't as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. So in reply to your affront to my manliness, I'll have to say yeah, I think I can manage the load. Craig smiled triumphantly, taking pride in his surgical dismantling of Trudy. But as Lorna often said regarding family gatherings, It's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt, then it's hilarious. Trudy rang up the two items and Craig handed her his credit card. She processed the transaction and handed Craig the receipt, grinning like a Cheshire cat. What's so humorous, you old witch? He wondered. Then he realized this was when he'd pay for his insolence. Because this was when, after charging the items, he'd have to sign the charge slip. Trudy had set the trap for him, and his arrogance and foolishness had led him right into it. Now he faced the consequences of a powerful and shrewd opponent. To his great horror, Craig realized that the only pin available was the one Trudy had been using to scratch her nasty head. The devil with a blue smock on was going so hard at the back of her greasy orb that he couldn't tell whether she was mining coal or dislodging a stubborn tick. Ow! He inwardly screeched. The corners of Trudy's lips stretched upward, displaying a wicked, toothless grin. Her contorted face reminded Craig of the Grinch, only uglier, with far less charm. Need a pen, hun? She mewed. No! Craig wailed. Not that he didn't need a pen. He didn't want that pen. He summoned his daring and looked Trudy straight in the eye that wasn't wandering. Okay, sister. Well, we can settle this minor dilemma in one of two ways. You can sanitize that pen, perhaps with some of that industrial strength solvent you're using as perfume, or I can chew off my hand and sign my name with the bloody stump. Trudy's legend as a grizzled veteran of checkout counter showdowns was well known among the townsfolk. She was radiant as she took notice of the sweat beads leaking through the pores on Craig's twitching face. The apprehension in his uncertain eyes was the cherry on top. She had seen that look countless times and it never ceased to delight her. The checkout line fell silent as the other customers stared on in suspense at the clash of the two titans. In that desperate moment, Craig could have sworn he heard a lone wolf howling in the distance, its haunting song drifting along on a cold prairie wind from the dairy section. His confidence wavered like a Girl Scout who had just lipped off at Connor McGregor. Trudy drew first, calling Craig's bluff. Shall I void your purchase, or are you going to stand there scratching your balls while the rest of us wait? A small boy who looked to be about seven called out to Craig. Don't do it, mister! Don't let her win! Steady, son. His mother said, putting her arm around his thin shoulders and pulling him closer. Sometimes a man has to come to terms with his limitations. But, Ma... The boy replied. Who'll stand up for us now? An elderly man near the back of the ever-growing line encouraged Craig. He's right, young fella. Why don't you 
hop up on the counter there. We the college folk, well, we'll see you there. Yeah, it'll give us hope. Craig shivered under Trudy's glacial glare. The woman was an oak. Stoic, strong, and immovable. He hated letting the other shoppers down after he had given them a small taste of victory over the dark domain that was Trudy's express line. But he knew they'd picked the wrong savior. Trudy was another female conqueror in his miserable life over which he held no power. I'm sorry, folks, Craig said mournfully. I know y'all and Bonnie Tyler have been holding out for a hero, but I just ain't him. He looked at the young boy who had cheered him on. I don't fret, little fella. A hero will come one day, and that hero might just be you. Shut it, Daffodil, the child shouted, flipping Craig the bird. Everyone in the checkout line lowered their heads in dejection, their gleeful grins fading into gloomy frowns of surrender. Craig sighed, wallowing in the humiliation of his failure. He accepted that he had no choice but to give in and use Trudy's pen slash skull probe to sign his name. His thoughts were somber. Resistance is futile. Her will is too strong. I'm Ned Culpepper and she's Rooster Cogburn charging across a smoky field. Reins in her teeth, a revolver in one hand and a Winchester in the other. And so it was, with solemn acquiescence coated with the putrid oil of revulsion, that Craig, grimly, achingly, signed his name. Craig chucked a small bag of items through the open window of his truck, nearly hitting his dog El Superbo in his big empty noggin. As he walked around to the driver's side door, his cell phone chirped. He pulled it from his wrinkled cargo shorts and glanced at the caller ID. It was his cousin Maddie calling. Although the two were close, more like siblings than cousins, their busy lives kept them from keeping in touch. Craig figured it must be something important for her to call him out of the blue. He swapped the call button. Hey there, Maddie. It's been a while. Is everything... Craig, I need your help. Maddie blubbered. <laughs> it's, it's Silas. Craig had never heard his cousin so distraught. She was one of the most upbeat people he knew. She stayed strong for herself and Silas, even when her loser husband Danny left to start a band combining country and rap music, a genre Lorna nicknamed Crap. For her to cry out for help, it must have been something awful. Slow ride, take it easy, said Craig. Tell me what's going on with my little buddy Silas. Maddie choked her emotions long enough to make herself understood. Craig, he, he's changed. I, I think he might be possessed. Craig's first thought was that Silas was acting out. Lord knew he had a right to. But after the bizarre and haunting experiences he and Lorna had gone through over the last several months, he took Maddie's concern seriously. Okay, Maddie, I want to help you. But first, we gotta be somewhere quiet. There's too many people yelling in the background. That ain't a group of people, Craig. <laughs> That's Silas. Craig parked his truck in front of Maddie's puke green two-story house. From outside, everything was peaceful. Birds were singing, bees were buzzing, and a fuzzy kitten was crapping in the yard. It's best you stay here. Craig said to Il Superbo, who was gnawing on his favorite chew toy, a large stuffed giraffe. I ain't exactly sure what's going on inside of there, but I got a feeling it might be something scary. And we don't do scary too good, do we, boy? Craig remembered the cowardly way he and Il Superbo had conducted themselves during the fiasco in the woods around his daddy's place. Even now, he wondered if he should fire up the truck and peel out before the going got tough. He felt a sharp twinge of shame about how easily the idea had occurred to him. But then, he held from a long line of cowards. Craig's great-grandfather on his daddy's side, Cooter Wankamoff, had survived the sinking of the Lusitania by fashioning a life raft made entirely out of women and children. Mary Poots McFadden, his maternal grandmother, had had a disabling dread of heights. Her husband, Jeremiah, had feared wits. 
Craig accepted early on that spinelessness flowed through his veins like sissified sap after wearing floaties to his baptism when he was fifteen years old. Come on now, Craig grumbled to himself. This is Maddie we're talking about. She's in there with God knows what, and you're out here marinating in chicken poop soup. Craig looked at the run-down house ahead of him and frowned at its sorry state since Danny had left. Unkempt hedges surrounded the front like a spiky green moat. Knee-high grass, a couple of scraggly dogwoods, and a cracked birdbath covered in white splotches made the property look like a magazine cover. For better homes and landfills, the only thing missing from the neglected yard was a for sale by neighbor's sign. Craig turned to El Superbo. I gotta go in there, don't I? I gotta do this for Maddie and Silas. Don't suppose you want to go in with me, do you? El Superbo belched and began dry-humping the giraffe. That's what I figured, Craig sighed. He got out of the truck, slammed the door shut, and walked toward the house. With his knuckles raised, ready to knock on the porch door, it flew open and a hand shot out, grabbing his t-shirt and hauling him inside. Thank God you're here, Maddie bawled. I think Silas is getting worse. He rails against me and God nonstop. I ain't slept more than an hour or two in the last few days. And even then, I have terrible dreams. When did it all start? About two weeks ago, Maddie said, rubbing her red eyes with the balls of her palms. He wasn't coughing or sick on his stomach. His skin was hot. Boiling. Then the night terror started. He'd wake up screaming and flailing a couple of times each night. What kind of bad dreams was they? It was always the same one. He'd find himself in a pitch black space. He said it was cold and smelled like rotten eggs and dead things. He couldn't see through the darkness, but he could hear people shuffling around him. Moaning and weeping. Sometimes they'd brush up against them. He said they felt so cold it took his breath away, like like when you jump in the freezing pond. Somebody with a scary voice was calling his name from far off. He said that as they drew closer, he felt the terror growing inside them. He wanted to run, but in the blackness, he didn't know which direction to go. He cried out for help, but nobody answered him except for that voice in the shadows. <laughs> it kept calling his name. He said that after a while, he felt a breath on his neck and heard a voice whisper, Mama can't hear you in hell. Fear sprinkled small cold dots on Craig's skin. He wondered again if he had made the right choice in coming. The pleading look on Maddie's haggard face reminded him he had. What came next? His entire personality changed. He got angry over little things. Then it got worse. So much worse. His body started twisting into horrible shapes. His eyes turned black as onyx. Then he turned violent and mean. Oh, Craig... He wouldn't believe some of the terrible things he said about me. Things he couldn't possibly know. When's the last time you checked on him? About an hour ago. His room got quiet, so I went up there, hoping that he'd finally gone to sleep. But he wasn't sleeping. He was... He was levitating. His body was spread out like Jesus on the cross. I heard these quick, loud rips, then holes appeared in his palms and feet. They was oozing black slime. Lord, how it stank. I wanted to scream until my throat seized up, but by then, I'd plumb run out of screams. Speaking of which, you might want to prepare for what you're going to see up there. Try hard not to panic. Fear only makes it laugh. Will he hurt us? asked Craig, his jaw tight with tension. If he wants to, 
Why are you calling Silas it? He's still your child, Maddie. Maddie's chest hitched. Fresh tears trailed down her pale cheeks. <laughs> because I don't really know where my baby is now. But I know that demon thing upstairs ain't him. Craig's nose whistled as he exhaled. All right, let's go check it out. Craig took his time ascending the steep staircase. He felt as if he were sneaking into a lion's cage to steal its meat. He heard Maddie following them. The creaking of their footsteps on the stairs sounded like thunder in the eerie silence. As they walked, he noticed short, nervous breaths filling the air, only to realize they were coming from him. When he reached the top, he hesitated, almost causing Maddie to rear-end them. You got this, Craig? Craig swallowed nervously, his Adam's apple bobbing up and down. Yeah, Maddie, I got this. Do you want to go first, or does it matter? It might be best if he sees a new face, and maybe it'll feel outnumbered. Works for me. Craig crept to the bedroom door and readied himself. He eased open the door. He was relieved and surprised to see Silas sitting up in bed, smiling as if he had finished watching a funny cartoon. The boy looked normal. No holes, no screaming, and no floating in midair. Normal. Silas? That you, boy? Well, who else was you expecting? Silas asked cheerfully. He looked at Maddie. Mama, are you okay? You look tired and sad. Silas looked surprised by the toppled furniture littering his room. Mama, what happened to my stuff? Was there an earthquake while I was sleeping? Maddie took cautious steps towards Silas's bed, her eyes scanning the room for any signs of danger. Baby, are you okay? Are you better now? Maddie's concern deepened the boy's confusion. Of course, Mama. Why wouldn't I be okay? Seeing no signs of spiritual shenanigans, annoyance began overtaking Craig's initial relief. Maddie, he said in a gruff tone, a word with you outside, please. He turned and stormed from the room. Maddie sensed his anger. She had an idea why he was upset. She pulled Silas to her chest, hugging him. Praise God, darling. He brung you back to me. Reflexively, Maddie jerked her head away from Silas, a foul odor of sweat and unwashed body parts attacking her nostrils. Shoo-wee, she said, crinkling her nose. Let me talk to Craig real quick, then we'll get you bathed and fed. You lay here and I'll be right back. She was nearly at the door when Silas called out to her. Uh, hey, Mama. Yes, yeah, sweetie. I love you. Me too, baby. Me too. Maddie! Craig bellowed from the hallway. A word, please! Maddie stepped into the hall and found Craig looking angrier than she had ever seen him. Craig, what's wrong? Ain't you happy that- You wanna tell me what's going on here? Craig growled, his heated eyes burning into Maddie's. What are you getting at? Can't you see that a miracle has taken place? You'd think you'd be happy. Craig pulled in air and released it slowly, hoping to calm himself before responding. Maddie, except for the room being torn up in some grungy pajamas, I don't see a thing wrong here. Maddie's breathing sounded like the huffing and puffing of a locomotive. Her face turned red, scrunching into a mask of anger. Are you suggesting that I faked all this? That I trashed Silas's room? And you think you're the one who ought to be ticked off? You got a heck of a nerve coming in here like Johnny come lately and taking away my joy because you weren't around when all the trouble was going on. I was the one cleaning up the blood and puke. I was the one listening to all the howling and screaming. I turned to the one person in my crappy life who I believed might care enough to help me when things went south. And who do I get? My awful no-account husband. That ain't fair, Maddie. You can't lump me in with that piece of crap. All I'm saying is you've been under a lot of stress for far too long a time. 
Anybody would understand if you turned to self-medication to numb the pain. Trashing the boy's room was just you acting out. Who could blame you? Let Lorna and me help you out some. We can take Silas for a spell. Craig let his worries of worry hover for a bit, allowing both of them time to let their heated emotions settle down. Maddie, I love you. Please, let me help you get through this. Maddie crossed her arms across her heaving chest, shaking her head from side to side in frustration. Just forget it, Craig. I can handle this all by myself. I don't need... <laughs> Sinister cackling traveled from the bedroom, crescendo and into a full-throated laugh. <laughs> Maddie and Craig saw fear in each other's eyes. They inched toward the bedroom, sliding their feet haltingly over the carpet, stopping at the door. They looked on in terror at the scrawny creature with bright yellow eyes jumping up and down on the bed like a hyperactive toddler. With its pajama top ripped away, they saw dark purple veins crisscrossing its bone-white body like railroad tracks. Small gray fangs shined through the pair of cracked bloody lips. Gotcha! It screeched. Can't believe you fell for that. <laughs> it began speaking in Maddie's voice. Oh, baby, are you better now? Praise God, darling. He brought you back to me. <laughs> then, in its own scratchy voice, returned. Looks like God had a hole in the bag he returned your sweet baby boy in. The demon flew off the bed and landed on the ceiling like a fly. Its head turned around on its crunching neck until it was peering down at Craig and Maddie, their faces fraught with unspoken horror. A long forked tongue unfurled from its twisted mouth, smearing its face with a shiny goop. Heard you two going at it in the hall. <laughs> oh, how I love it when the children fight. It resumed its loud chortling, causing the walls to crack under the deafening volume. Holy Rosseroni to San Francisco tree! Craig shouted. He and Maddie scurried to the hall, both of them sweating and breathless from the unexpected encounter with the demon. Sorry for thinking so poorly of you, Maddie, Craig said humbly. That thing played me like it was Eddie Van Halen. He yanked his cell phone from the pocket of his shorts and began punching numbers. What are you doing? Maddie asked, her voice wavering from her overwrought nerves. It's gonna take a demon to fight a demon. I'm calling Lorna. Lorna kept looking at the clock on the hair salon's wall. She felt as though she'd been snipping hair for days. Her feet hurt, her back was sore and her stomach was rumbling like a souped-up Harley. But the discomfort paled compared to the endless yammering coming from the odd woman whose hair she was attempting to repair. The Gabby gal was going on about the tragic series of events that led her to Lorna's styling station. Ernest and his dopey family insisted that we go to a Japanese steakhouse called A Taste of Tokyo, she explained. Said they heard it was an authentic Japanese dining experience. The first thing I noticed when we got there was this kind of special magical vibe. The oriental music being popped in was mesmerizing. They decorated the entrance with what appeared to be priceless ancient Japanese artifacts. So it was kind of a letdown when Vicky, the chick who checked us in, confided that Dave Shapiro, the owner, had found it all on eBay. Well now, honey, we waited forever for that hostess to call our number. By the time she finally did, I felt like I'd been waiting in line to get on Space Mountain. Well, sir, we squeezed in with some other people around the long, flat-top grill. Whilst we waited for our chef to arrive, I couldn't resist watching the other ones perform. They was like a group of great priestly magicians cloaked in the ancient art of culinary mysticism. They was one part master chef, one part ninja, and two parts entertainers. Let me tell you, sister, they rocked. They was finger twirling their knives like rock drummers. 
One of them was flicking charred shrimp tails into the air and catching them in the top of his hat for crying out loud. I was starting to look forward to seeing what our ship was going to do. When he finally showed up, we was all a little surprised and disappointed. They must have ran out of Japanese cooks because this little sucker was as Mexican as a burrito. He welcomed us, told us his name was Pedro, and that he had just graduated from Donnie's School of Asian Cuisine, Taxidermy, and Exotic Dancing. Of course, we all kind of figured that out by the writing on his chef's hat that read I graduated from Donnie's and all I got was this silly hat. I was mighty glad Ernest didn't say nothing stupid and bigoted to him. He keeps going on about how if the government don't keep the Mexicans from pouring over the border, they're gonna have this whole country sheetrocked in under five years. Anyhow, Pedro got things going by leading us in a sing-along of La Bamba while he got his stuff ready. Next thing we knowed, he was spinning one of them big old knives and screaming, Bonsai, amigos! Well, the glare from the overhead light must have hit that shiny blade just right and seared his peepers cause he let out a yell like his pecker had tripped a mouse trap. Then he commenced to panicking and swinging wild with that razor sharp knife of his. Well now honey, I felt this whoosh of air over the top of my head. I didn't know whether to scream or cry when I seen the top half of my bouffant row past my face like a tumbleweed and land on that hot grill. I must have gone a little heavy on the hairspray, cause when that thing hit the heat, it burst into a massive fireball. Well, sir, people started running and screaming. There was this elderly woman who was so old, she probably knew the Dollar General back when he was a buck private. Well, she hollered, Take me home, country roads, and flung herself through one of the plate glass windows. Anyhow, Pedro tried to put out the fire with what he must have thought was water, but it turned out to be the flammable cooking oil. The blinding flash probably made them poor Japanese cooks think Truman had come back from the dead to drop another begging on them. I heard one of them yell, Rock's a rock! Then him and the other cooks took off like they was chained to a SpaceX rocket. Well, looked like a good idea to us, so we let out too. Anyways, honey, that's how I ended up here with you. Is there enough hair to work with? Well, I'll tell you, Lorna said, shaking her head. I've seen more hair on my dog's balls, but I'll do the best I can. Oh, I almost forgot to ask, Vonda, the other stylist, said. How's old El Superbo been doing? <laughs> Lorna grimaced. Honestly, Vonda, that dumb dog river dances on my nerves every chance he gets. Talk about annoying. Five minutes alone with that stupid mutt would make Jesus want to bitch slap a Quaker. Know what you mean. Our mutt, Luke, recently started identifying as a frisbee. We've been having a heck of a time keeping him off the neighbor's roof. Now Lorna really needed a break. She was thankful when her phone interrupted the insanity. She recognized the ringtone immediately. Loser by Beck meant only one thing. Craig had foobarred something again. I gotta take this, y'all. Lorna went to the back room and answered her phone. How much we being sued for? Lorna, this is no time for jokes. Maddie and Silas are in a bad way. They need our help something awful. Craig's right. This ain't no time for jokes, thought Lorna. Maddie and Silas were the only one of Craig's relatives that she cared for. She'd been there for Maddie when Danny left her to raise Silas alone. She remembered standing in Maddie's kitchen, sobbing into a dish towel, while she listened to her in the living room. The chasms in Lorna's broken heart splintered wider and deeper with every recollection of Silas's small, innocent voice. Mama, did I do something wrong? Is that why Daddy don't love us no more? The memory was closing in on her mind even now. She fought to keep the dark thoughts away to be of use to Maddie and Silas. Are they okay? What's wrong? My lord, what's happened now? Don't get mad, but I can't explain it to you over the phone. Can you leave early and get over here? Lorna's heart dropped to her stomach as worst-case scenarios sped along her mental highway. Are they hurt? Are they alive? Please, Craig, tell me something. 
Lorna's concerned moose, Craig. True, she was as tough as cheap meat, but when she cared about you, you knew it. They're okay, but not okay. You know what I mean? Lorna was pacing back and forth like a panther in a cage. She felt tightness in her chest. Her stomach tumbled inside her. No, Craig, I don't know what you mean. Although he knew he was going to sound stupid to Lorna, nothing new there, he filled her in anyhow. It's Silas. Something evil's taking hold of him. I couldn't believe my eyes when I seen how he looked, how he acted. Lorna felt foolish for believing Craig. Dang it, Craig, you nearly scared me to death. You called me over a boogeyman? Lorna, I ain't messing around here. I think they're both in danger from something I can't quite explain. I don't know what to do about this. I really need you to come help. Craig's tone gave Lorna pause. She thought back to the supernatural event with the possessed chair and the investigation of the Yeti in the woods. What if something really is wrong? She wondered. All right, then. Tell Maddie and Silas I'm on my way. Oh, and Craig? Yeah? Don't let nothing happen to them. They's as much my kin as yours. There was that love again. Sure, darling. I ain't gonna leave him for an instant. You better not, Lorna said before hanging up. Craig felt better already. The devil might be hiding upstairs, but hell's most fiery beast was on its way. And boy, it was pissed. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by Mint Mobile. You know what stinks? Signing up with a big wireless provider thinking you just got the deal of a lifetime on a brand new state-of-the-art piece of equipment. But then a month or so later, getting that bill that makes your knees wobble. And then they keep wobbling when you realize that that was just the first of many. It's like being trapped on some hellish roller coaster headed full speed to the poorhouse. If only there was a wireless provider that offered the exact same service without selling you into cellular serfdom. Try saying that one five times fast. Better yet, check out our friends at Mint Mobile, who have just the solution you're looking for. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just 15 bucks a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just $15. Seriously. Take what you're paying right now, subtract $15, and imagine finding all that in the pocket of one of your old pairs of pants. Every month. Blessed be. How's the service, you ask? Well, Mint Mobile delivers high-speed data on the nation's largest 5G network. Which means I'm on the same network I've always been on, just paying a whole lot less for it. Call me crazy, but I kind of prefer paying a whole lot less for it. Now, I'm not here to disparage big wireless friends. Lord knows I'm too classy for that. But the Surgeon General says walking is a healthy exercise, so I do want to suggest that they take a long one, preferably off a short pier if the water's nice. You know me, I'm just trying to keep everyone healthy. So get off that infernal roller coaster and switch to Mint Mobile. It's a limited time offer, friends, so do it today. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, Go to mintmobile.com slash drew. That's mintmobile.com slash drew. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash drew. Thanks for your support, friends, and for supporting our valuable sponsors. The beat-up orange compact known as the pumpkin car skidded to a stop in front of Maddie's place. With some effort, Lorna pulled herself out of the tiny ride, much to the relief of its shock absorbers. Walking past Craig's truck, she noticed El Superbo in the cab performing a sexual act on a stuffed animal so depraved that it would get you kicked out of a back alley brothel in Tijuana. I sure hope that sex is consensual, you pervert, she remarked to the horny mutt. <laughs> El Superbo cared little for Lorna's tone. She didn't care for his tone either. 
You better back down, boy, or so help me, I'll rip that heat-seeking missile of yours off and change your name to Mr. Twinkles. If El Superbo still had the sombrero that Craig had purchased for him a while back, he would have tipped it. Instead, he lowered his ears and issued a faint whimper. Hmm. Mm-hmm, that's what I thought. Lorna walked across the yard and climbed the porch's warped wooden steps. She beat on the front door like it had just trash-talked her mama. The loud pounding scared Craig and Maddie, who huddled together in the kitchen. That must be Lorna, said Maddie. You think? Craig replied sarcastically. Craig, Maddie, y'all still alive in there? Said the voice from the porch. A skinny middle-aged man wearing boxer shorts and a stained wife-beater tank top came out on the porch of the house next door. He cupped his hands in front of his mouth. Hey, y'all better keep it down over there. I'll call the law if I have to. Lorna stomped to the edge of Maddie's porch and gave the man her patented glare of disapproval. You do that, you dingleberry from a baboon's butt crack. I'll come over there and yank them pissy poopy jizzy drawers down and play your butt cheeks like a pair of conga drums. Anger left the man as he realized he had poked the wrong bear. He broke eye contact with Lorna, letting his bald head drop to his puny hairless chest. I'm awful sorry, ma'am. I ain't been myself since my dog died. The pitiful man's excuse didn't move the needle on Lorna's compassion meter by a single digit. She hated dogs. El Superbo had seen to that. She had so little sympathy for dogs, injured or otherwise, that whenever one of Sarah McLaughlin's animal welfare ads came on, she wanted to hunt her down and rip the arms off her angel. Lorna grinned at the grieving man. Well, considering he was your dog, it must have been a suicide. She turned on her heels and returned to the door just in time for Maddie to open it leaving the distraught neighbor bawling with self-reproach. Oh, Lorna, Maddie said. Thank you for coming. Craig's in the kitchen. Lorna gave her a firm hug. I'm glad to be here, Maddie, darling. Let's get on to the kitchen before Craig starts rooting through the trash. Lorna and Maddie entered the kitchen and found Craig sitting at a small table, his head buried in his hands. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. He mumbled repeatedly. Glad to see you're being so helpful, Craig, Lorna said, breaking his spell. We're both more than a little shook up, Maddie said, coming to Craig's defense. So, what exactly's been going on? Lorna asked Maddie. Crouching tiger hidden hamster over there said something evil is taking over Silas. Care to clarify for me? Craig spoke first. Maddie, take her upstairs and let her see for herself. She'll never believe us otherwise. He's right, Lorna. I need you to understand what's happening to my baby. Words alone ain't enough to describe it. Lead the way, Lorna said officiously. Maddie led Lorna upstairs with Craig bringing up the rear. She stopped at Silas's bedroom door. Be as strong as I know you can be, Lorna. It's like I told Craig. Fear makes it laugh. Lorna scowled. Yeah, I'm like that too. Maddie opened the door and stepped aside, allowing Craig and Lorna to enter first. The former Silas was lying on his back in bed, his chest ballooning to a colossal size with each wheezy breath, his ribcage creaking from the strain. Craig and Maddie remained near the door, prepared to run if they needed to. Lorna marched to the foot of the bed with her hands rolled into fists and fire in her soul. She let out a short, shrill whistle as though she were summoning a dog. Hey, you in there. Silas, you better get out here and talk to me. The creature's panting stopped. Its body stiffened and snapped into a standing position, as if it were falling down in reverse. Despite the demon boy's defiance of physics, Lorna remained nonplussed. Well now, that's something you don't see every day. She rested her hands on her wide hips, cocked her head to the side, and sized up her opponent. That all you got, you ugly gomer? I'm not impressed. What you gonna do next? Pull the pony out your butt? Do not mock me, woman, the demon growled. Your kind holds no power over me. 
You might want to ask Craig about the power I have over men. Lorna looked back at Craig. Testify, brother. Testify. Choose your words carefully, bitch. The demon sneered. Oh, snap, thought Craig. I hope son of Chucky brought a helmet, some pads, and a jockstrap, cause Lorna's about to teach him some manners. Lorna's face contorted into a terrifying rictus of rage. The only thing I'm gonna be choosing is which foot I'm gonna bury in your stupid butt. The Silas monster threw its head back and screamed in fury, fixing its hateful gaze on Lorna. Be gone, foolish pig! A powerful whoosh of air rushed through the room, lifting and propelling Lorna backwards. Craig had been on the receiving end of countless ticked-off Lorna looks, but this one, a look of fear and helplessness, was as chilling as it was foreign to him. Still, he couldn't help but snicker as he saw her whistling by like a barfly cannonball. Lorna's airborne body sailed through the doorway and along the short hall before being hurtled down the staircase by the demonic force. Craig and Maddie stood like statues as the sound of Lorna's hefty frame careening down the long flight of stairs reverberated throughout the house. When they heard her skidding to a stop at the bottom, they broke from their trance and went to check on her. They found Lorna sprawled near the front door, unconscious and looking worse for wear. Her ill-fitting spandex shorts were around her ankles, revealing her favorite pair of panties commemorating the musical career of Garth Brooks. The endless somersaulting down the staircase had caused her hair to wrap around her head like a bleached blonde turban. Her droopy left boob had popped free of its restraint. Dear God! Maddie shouted, rushing to Lorna. Honey, speak to me. Please wake up. Craig ambled down the steps and stood over the two. You're doing it all wrong, rookie, he said to Maddie. Watch this. Pizza's here. Lorna sprang up to a sitting position. You better save me a slice, Slim Jim. See? Told you, Craig sniffed. Maddie threw her arms around Lorna. Praise the Lord, darling. I was scared you was dead. Lorna pushed Maddie away. Well, I will be if you don't stop squeezing the life out of me. Confused, she looked at Craig. What the heck just happened? The devil boy chucked you down them flight of stairs. Your big old tail busted the heck out of the wall and banister. Talk about a racket. Sounded like a Neil Pert solo. The important thing is that you're all right, Maddie said. I'm afraid to say it. But that awful thing has grown stronger, more dangerous. What are we going to do, y'all? Lorna stuffed her wayward boo back into her bra and brushed her hair from her face, revealing a look of contemplation. I was hoping it weren't going to come to this, but I think I might have an answer. Sunday morning was a hot one. It didn't help that the sanctuary was full and cramped. Lorna leaned close to Craig. That gum is hotter than hell in here. And humid, too. At least in hell, it's a dry heat. Are you sure this is a good idea? We don't know the first thing about this preacher. Myrna, from down at the Snappy Snip, said her mama comes here regularly. According to her, this guy's supposed to be a Bible-smacking, firing, brimstone, no-holds-barred kind of preacher. If anybody can get rid of that thing that's got its hooks into my angel Silas, then it's got to be this guy. All right. Let's just settle in and see what we got here. Lorna and Craig observed a congregation made up of lower-income, working-class people. Men with grease beneath their nails were wearing clip-on ties, and women who had so much makeup on they resembled Pennywise the Clown, if he had been a drag queen. Looking at Craig, Lorna figured she had no reason to judge other people's appearances. Craig had never been one to dress to the nines. It was more like two and three-fourths. She was often ashamed of being seen with them. She wistfully thought, If only I had married Mr. Wright instead of getting stuck with Mr. Wright next to the guy I should have married. Craig felt the side of his head getting hot. That meant Lorna was giving him one of her heated stares. What is it now, Lorna? Spit it out. It'll improve the taste. Why'd you wear that tacky shirt? 
You look like the Grand Marshal in a gay pride parade. Lorna's offensive observation put Craig on defense. Maybe I wore this shirt to make a fashion statement. What's the statement? Hi there, sailor. New in town? And Lord have mercy, what is going on with your hair? I know I didn't style it like that. All I can say is you must have ticked off somebody at Great Clips. Cause you look like Colin Copernic experimenting with Crisco and electricity. While one of two deacons was reminding a couple of congregants that smoking wasn't allowed inside the sanctuary, his counterpart made a loud announcement. Okay, everybody. Stand for the entrance of the senior pastor. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by BetterHelp. When you reach that proverbial crossroads in life, it's usually one of two things. A big life decision with consequences attached to it, or the devil waiting to teach you some badass guitar licks. If it's the second, just walk away. There's plenty of tablature on the internet. If it's the first, well, I suggest you speak with your therapist. And if you don't have one yet, do yourself a favor and visit BetterHelp. If you've given therapy some thought but never pulled the trigger, let me tell you. With BetterHelp, you can put your worries to bed. First, it's completely remote, so you never have to visit an office. Second, it's affordable, much cheaper than traditional therapy. You get a full-time, licensed, professional therapist, never further away than your phone. In short, you'll never face one of these big decisions on your own again. Just fill out the brief questionnaire on their website to help them get to know you, and in as few as 48 hours, you'll be matched with the perfect therapist. You can text anytime and count on prompt, thoughtful advice. Every week, you'll schedule a phone call or video chat at your convenience to catch up. Again, it's all done remotely. You get the treatment you want, but with the space, privacy, and convenience you need. I'm a big supporter of therapy, and I'll tell you why. Two heads are better than one. So whatever life decisions, relationship problems, or career dilemmas you're facing, therapy can help you map out your future and find a way forward. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash DarkTales today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash DarkTales. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. The crowd watched as a slump-shouldered man in a second-hand suit entered and stood behind the podium covered in green shag carpet. With the word Rev posted on the front in bright silver glitter, it looked like something you'd see on a reality show called Pimp My Pulpit. He had a creepy vibe about him, a combination of circus carny and serial pedophile. His slick back hair was an unnatural shade of black that screamed expired Clairol hair dye. His eyes were dark and beady, his lips tight and thin. He had pulled back his facial skin so tightly that it made Lorna concerned that his eyeballs would pop out of his head. He faced away from the congregation and bowed to the wooden cross behind him. Lorna held back a guffaw of epic proportions when she noticed the duct tape on the back of his neck serving as a DIY facelift. With a great theatrical panache, he motioned for the congregation to sit down. Don't freak out if he starts swatting at imaginary flies, whispered someone seated behind them. He's only been out of rehab a few weeks, so he still has the DTs. The pastor cleared the smoker's phlegm from his throat, and the service began. <coughs> <coughs> Good morning, brothers and sisters, honored guests, and fellow hemorrhoid sufferers. I'm the right Reverend Ronnie Don Smellum. And I'd like to give a big ol' howdy-do to all of you here this morning at Buttermilk Bible Chapel, <laughs> where sin is a four-letter word. We're all thrilled to be here in our newly leased facility, or as it was called a short while back, AutoZone, yay. Hey. 
If this is your first time here, we are deeply pleased. If this is your second time here, we are downright astonished. If you wouldn't mind, please grab one of them little red putt-putt pencils off the back of the seat in front of you. And just take a moment to fill out one of our G's. I can't believe I let you drag me here cards. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. First off, for all you parents who dropped your kids off at our children ministry, please keep an eye peeled to the bottom right hand corner of the screen next to me. You see your child's assigned number flashing. Please go as quickly as possible back to the children's ministry. The flashing number is an indicator that our volunteers have had enough of your little hopped up howler monkey and are preparing to fling them out of a catapult they have aimed at the interstate. Thank y'all in advance for your courtesy and cooperation, amen. Also, we here at Buttermilk Bible Chapel, where sin is a four-letter... For the love of Mike Lindale's creepy mustache. Who came up with that slogan? Anyways, we care deeply about the well-being of all our members. In this spirit, we'll be holding a day-long seminar back in our fellowship trailer on May 15th, yes. Which we deal with the subject of Christian dieting and fitness. Now, I don't want to start naming names or nothing. But some of y'all are so fat that when you jump up to sing, you make the praise band skip. Hey. Personally, I'd love to get as many of y'all as possible in here on Sunday mornings. I just don't want to have to grease the door frames to do it. It's pretty bad when only a half dozen of y'all can put us over our fire capacity. Mm -mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Well, let's get started. Many of you may have noticed that our praise band ain't here today. Apparently, while they were rehearsing over in the band director's garage on Wednesday night, they ingested some bad fondue. Consequently, they're all recovering from an evil force more commonly known mm -mm -mm, as the Screaming Squirts. Still, if I may paraphrase scripture, what bad fondue meant for evil, the Lord meant for good. Amen. That explains our next treat. To fill in our ailing praise band, we have some very special musical guests here this morning, all the way from Pork Rind, South Carolina. Please join me here as we welcome a wonderful a cappella southern gospel group, the Stuttering Shepherds. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Four nervous and well-attired men took to the stage. One of them reached into his suit jacket and retrieved the pitch pipe. He blew into it, and they hummed to match its key. With their pitch set, they began the performance. Going down to the... River going down to the river going down to the river gonna wash my whoa, 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 whoa. Judas on a moped, no wonder y'all come so cheap. You sound like the backup singers for Pocket Pig. <laughs> Thanks for coming, boys. Thank you kindly. With their collective dignity stripped from them, the disgruntled and embarrassed quartet left the stage and headed for the nearest exit. As they passed Lorna and Craig, one of them grumbled. I ought to grab hold of his Bible, duct tape him to a pew, and read the book of Genesis to him. Smellum continued to hasten their exit. While the stuttering shepherds make their way down, can I get one of the deacons to go ahead and pay them out of our petty cash? That way, we can get them back to Pork Rind before the town council there has to look for a new group of village idiots. Amen. Smellum's eyes bulged when he took a gander at his wristwatch. Yes. Well, would you look at the time? 
If we don't wrap up soon, we'll never beat the Baptist down to the Crackle Barrel. Yay. Tell you what, we'll keep today's message short and sweet. Here we go. Today's message is God good, devil bad. Any questions? Good. Now somebody find my car keys and I'll see y'all next time here at Buttermilk Bible Chapel, where sin is a four-letter. Oh, never mind. Craig and Lorna hung back while the other churchgoers shook Reverend Smellum's hand. After a few minutes of watching him press the flesh, it was finally their turn. The man's noxious scent, a mixture of hair oil and hard liquor, was so overpowering that it made their eyes water. And then there was his dandruff. Even though it was August in Claxton, Georgia, Lorna wondered if the clouds hadn't opened up and sprinkled snowflakes over the shoulder pads of his navy blue suit. Upon seeing Craig and Lorna, Smellum flashed a wide jack-o'-lantern grin that revealed perfect pearly white teeth. Well, welcome, y'all, welcome. I don't believe I've seen y'all here before. What'd you think of the service? Unforgettable, said Craig. But Lord knows I'll try. Lorna made a different observation. Is that whiskey I smell on your breath? Ma'am, Smellum stated resolutely. I'll have you know that since I joined AA, alcohol has not touched my lips. However, I can't say enough about them new Jim Bean suppositories. Hey. After a quick chuckle, he continued. Now then, let this old country pastor share an observation with you. I get the feeling you two ain't here to find religion. You're here because you need some spiritual help. Am I right? That'd be right. I got this cousin, see, and she's having some terrible trouble with her boy. Lots of kids give their parents problems. Shoo, my mama and me fought all the time. But the makeup sex always made it worth it. <laughs> What's so bad about this one that you have to turn to a pasture for help? Fair warning, I don't do counseling to others very well. Fact is, it's usually me in some type of counseling. Can I be frank with you, Pastor? You can be whoever you want to be, <laughs> replied Smellum, ogling her sizable chest. Lorna was aghast. Excuse me, but my face is up here. Yeah, but your boobies are down here. <laughs> Boy, howdy, they are a glorious sight to behold. It was all Craig could do not to send Smellum's brilliant veneers flying across the parking lot like rocket-propelled Tic Tacs. Now listen here, preacher or not, nobody says that to my old lady. Down, boy, Lorna said to Craig. At my age, I'll take any compliment I can get. Craig snorted in frustration. Fine, then. He glowered at Smellum. Look, what she was trying to tell you, we're trying to tell you, is that it looks like a demon has possessed our young nephew. He looks like a monster, cusses like a sailor, and smells like a porta potty on an asparagus farm in South America in the middle of July. Get the picture yet? Smellum, offended by Craig's harsh tone, soured. I'd like to help y'all, but I'm going to be tied up for the rest of the afternoon. Worried he may have killed any chance of enlisting Smellum's help, Craig attempted to salvage things. I'm sorry for what I said, Pastor. It's just that. Oh, Ronnie Dunn. Mewed an attractive woman wearing a sheer blouse and a skirt so tight you could tell her religion. I'll be ready around three with your favorite rope. Smellum waved to her. I might all go with nylon this time, Shug, huh? The jute tends to chafe. <laughs> He resumed his awkward conversation with Craig and Lorna. I know what this looks like, but a, a stallion's got to run free. Do tell. Don't tell. Look, we'll do anything you need us to do to help you with the exorcism. Smellum's eyes spread wide as he raised his palms in a warden-off gesture. Oh, hang on, Sloopy. Sloopy, hang on. I ain't never said nothing about doing no exorcism. That there's above my pay grade. 
Craig took a step closer to smell them, his face dour and desperate. Reverend, we're just a couple of sinners in need of some mercy. Take me, for example. I, I wasn't baptized. I was pressure washed. And Lorna here... Speak for yourself, O oh burning itch on the groin of Satan. I may be mean, but that's cause I'm a sword of the Lord. Craig picked up where he left off. Pastor Ronnie Don, God knows all about our mistakes. Every one of us has got a good old-fashioned belt whomping coming to us on the day of judgment. But I also know he's a God of mercy, of redemption. There's a sweet, innocent child who's probably being attacked by the devil himself. Maybe if we save him, we can earn a little of that redemption for ourselves. What is it the Bible says about standing up to evil for such a time as this? Smellum felt convicted. It occurred to him that maybe for the first time in a long time, he might live up to his sacred calling. Listen, this might be the gin talking, but I'll try to figure out a way to help y'all. Let me give the matter some thought, and we'll meet tomorrow to discuss it. How's about noonish at the Christian bookstore downtown on Fell Street? Craig and Lorna shared a palpable relief. Thank you, preacher, Craig said, shaking Smellum's hand vigorously. We'll be there with bells on. Oh, I wouldn't do that, warned Smellum. That might seem weird and distracting to the other customers. Craig became flustered and impatient. No, 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 I, I just meant that. He means we'll see you there, Lorna finished. Smellum flashed a lightning white smile. It's a date, then. He staggered to a white Plymouth neon with a hood that someone had replaced with a purple one. He braced his foot against the frame on the driver's side of the wreck and pulled hard until the door popped free with a loud clang. After a couple of minutes of fondling his way to his car keys, he got in and blasted out of the parking lot, marching band music blaring from the car's speakers. You think he'll be able to help? asked Craig. Lorna shrugged, shaking her head in doubt. I don't know, Craig. That boy's head is emptier than the tomb on Easter morning. As agreed, Craig and Lorna arrived at the bookstore Reverend Smellum had suggested, The Silence of the Lamb. Neither of them had ever been in a bookstore before, much less a Christian one, so they were a tad apprehensive. The rich smell of fresh coffee blends, baked goods, and honest-to-goodness hard-covered books welcomed them. Delighton was gentle and inviting, unlike other stores with their harsh bright lights that make everything look as if it were ready to be dissected in a sterile lab. Music of faith flowed down from overhead speakers, filling the store with its melodic message of hope and love in a world that's been breaking bad for a while. A smiling young woman in a colorful floral sundress greeted them. Hi, she said cheerfully. Welcome to Silence of the Lamb. My name's Anna. Can I help you find anything? Uh, no, Craig said sheepishly. We're supposed to be meeting the preacher here in a bit. I think we'll do a little exploring whilst we wait. Okay, our cafe is straight back, our music section is along the left wall, and our books are everywhere else. Please let me know if I can help you in any way. Lorna trembled. She felt her aura of meanness and harsh judgment wilting under the bold golden light of the young woman's genuine kindness. In her distress, Lorna reached to her right, grabbed a small brass cross from a shelf, and held it in front of Anna's face. Flee from me, O oh sweet perky cherub of goodness! Anna's bright eyes widened. Her bottom lip gave in to gravity as if she were using a brick as a lip ring. Um, I'll just go then. Let me know if you change your minds. She turned and trotted down a narrow aisle, hiding behind a large wooden bookcase located under a banner that read, Jesus saves and so can you with our frequent shopper card. Craig narrowed his eyes at Lorna. Now why in the world would you go and be mean to somebody as nice as that? I can't exactly say, Lorna said. Her humility, intelligence, and warmth were too overwhelming. I could feel my hatred of you and others slipping away. What was I supposed to do? I couldn't just let her take away my reason for living. Besides, she made me feel inadequate. 
With people like that in line at the pearly gates, I'll never get into heaven. Oh, now sure you will, Craig said consolingly. They'll just give you a room near the ice-making machine. Lorna, as she typically was with one of Craig's pithy remarks, was unamused. Her face hardened and her voice dropped to the floor rumbling octave she used to get a point across to the victim in her crosshairs. You know, Craig, there's times when I want to thank you for caring enough about me to lovingly speak hard truths, no matter how much it pains you to do so. But then, there's times like now when I want to squirt you in your face with WD-40, light your head on fire, and watch you hop around like a dancing tiki torch. Craig had once promised Lorna that he would love her for all his days. He never said those days would run consecutively. Now look, Lorna. I was only saying that. Someone nearby was clearing their throat loudly. Lorna and Craig turned toward the noise and saw Reverend Smellum sitting at a table in the cafe, waving his arms, trying to get their attention. Craig waved back, then he and Lorna walked toward the cafe. Along their crooked path, they sauntered by rows of bobblehead disciples and poorly made religious films with a budget that could barely cover breakfast at IHOP. They paused to play with a life-sized Moses doll that danced to a hip-hop version of bringing in the sheaves when they clapped their hands. After watching the biblical prophet throw his hands in the air like he just didn't care, they joined Smellum at his table in the cafe. Their prurient pastor was well into a thick, meaty sandwich. The loud, wet smacking of his lips sounded like someone beating an octopus against the brick wall. Mm hmm Y'all want something to eat? I love these here turkey and Havarti sandwiches. I can get them with bacon. I know, I know. Beer is God's way of saying he loves his children and wants them to be happy. <laughs> and bacon is his way of saying he misses us and wants us to drop by the house real soon. Still, how's about one of these suckers? Hmm? The church gives me an expense account for stuff like this. Bless their hearts. <laughs> they also give me another used company car when I drove the last one through the coffee bar. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I love them folks. <laughs> I knew right off the bat I'd have a problem with the firewater, the drugs, the hookers, them poor little farm animals that I... We got you. We got you. Craig interrupted for all their sakes. Like we told you at the church, we got Ken who might be possessed by none other than old Scratch himself. The doctors ain't helped. The child psychologists ain't helped. The Robitussin ain't helped. And that crap cures everything. Mm. Whoa there, Sally. Mm. You better slow that Mustang down, <laughs> said Smellum. Mm. Describe to me some of the symptoms you've seen. Craig hesitated. He feared that if he relayed everything he had witnessed to the Reverend, he might appear crazy. Then whom would he ever find to help them deal with the demon? Lorna sensed Craig's reluctance. Walking up the walls. He's been walking up the walls. His body is all deformed. We hardly recognize him. He speaks in tongues and says the most god-awful things you can't ever imagine coming from a little boy. His mama's tired and scared. All we're asking is that you come by and look for yourself. Hopefully, you being a man of God and all, you can do something to help the child. Smellum stroked his chin and thought. <laughs> well, this might be the myth talking, but you've stoked my curiosity. <laughs> Of course, it's curiosity that killed the cat. You sure? Lorna asked. I thought it was the brick I throwed at it. Lorna, please. That's neither here nor there. Smellum's face took on a puzzled look. Hmm. Well, if it ain't here nor there, then where the heck is it? Can we get back to the matter at hand? <clears throat> sure enough. Smellum boomed, slapping his palms on the tabletop. Mm, what say we bring some bread together? He turned and hollered at a woman behind the counter full of baked goods. Uh, excuse me there, miss. Can we get a couple more of them turkey and Havani sandwiches? He leaned toward Craig and Lorna. Uh, Y'all want tea with that? Yep. And can we get an appetizer too? Of course, the cafe employee said. What would you like? 
Craig and Lorna perused the laminated menu. Give us one of them Nazarene nacho platters, Lorna instructed. The woman entered the information into a POS system and went about helping another employee in the kitchen prepare the order. Smellum leaned back and laced his nicotine-stained fingers behind his well-oiled head. <clears throat> Before we get rolling on this thing, I feel it would be fitting to lay our cards on the table. In admitting our sins to one another, we established honesty and accountability. Craig, you want to start us off? For example, are you a practicing Christian? I sure am. I'm hoping that if I keep practicing, I might be good enough to go pro after my senior year. Lorna rolled her eyes. Just ignore him, Pastor. Craig's a real smart ass. Well, it did score a 1600 on its SAT, Craig said proudly. Smell him turn to Lorna. Okay, young lady, your turn. Share with me something that you struggle with from time to time. If the idea was to lay her soul bare, then Lorna was going for the gold. Some nights, I like to watch Craig sleep while I toy with ideas about how I can scratch murder off my bucket list. Craig shook his head. Not only was Lorna driving him to an early grave, she was lead-footing and blowing through stop signs to get him there. Woman, you're so cold that every time I kiss you, my scrotum shrivels and I get ice cream headaches. Smellum broke in to quell the dispute. All right, uh, looks like it's time for me to do some confessing. Y'all, I got a thing for the ladies. There, I said it. Yeah, baby, when it comes to getting my freak on, I like to head down to Funny Town. <laughs> oh, back when I was doing mission work in Korea, I used to frequent this place where a dominatrix by the name of Song Sung Blue would whip my bare bottom with a strip of Hot Wheels track. <laughs> Talk about some ooh-la-la. Hey. Lorna had heard far too much info. Well, I can assure you my Craig may have his faults, but he ain't never had no hooker named Song Sung Blue whipping his butt. She's right, Craig agreed. Hooker who lit up my fanny was named Velvet. Shut up, Lorna bellowed. She was relieved when the server identified as Bethany on her name tag brought the appetizers to their table. When Craig reached out his hand to grab one of the hot, cheesy chips, Lorna slapped his wrist. Will you hold on for a second? She looked at Smellum. I've always wondered about something. Fire at will, Smellum answered, reaching for a nacho himself. Do you say grace when the salad or appetizers come, or do you wait until the entree? I usually do it over the entree myself. Excuse me, but that's not quite accurate, said Bethany from behind the counter. It's the first food to arrive that you're to bless. A man's voice behind them chimed in. No, no, no. You say grace when the actual meal comes out, not before. Oh, nonsense, Herman, said the man's female companion. It's appropriate to bless the meal once the initial process begins. The man seemed offended and embarrassed by the correction. Sorry, you'll have to overlook my wife's remark. Then he addressed his wife. Look, Natalie, it only makes sense to give thanks when the best part of the meal is partaken. Well, what about those of us who enjoy desserts the most? Asked Craig. For us, that's the best part of the meal. With all due respect to everyone, said Bethany. Neither salads nor appetizers were served during the Last Supper, and that's about as big a culinary event as there ever was. So technically, they blessed the first thing that was brought out. Lorna, an active participant in many backyard squabbles, could see where this train car full of poisonous chemicals was heading. She attempted to intervene before it got derailed. Listen, y'all, there ain't no cause to get all worked up about- You're a jerk, Herman! screeched Natalie. You're woefully ignorant of biblical dining protocol and, frankly, a selfish lover. Herman recoiled at Natalie's public announcement. Oh, yeah? As we laid in darkness on the first night I took you, I thought you were lying on your stomach. I was, of course, wrong. You just don't have any boobs. My word, shouted Bethany, her face reddened with embarrassment. Oh, shut up, Natalie yelled at her. You and your insipid yammering about, oh, the last supper. Why don't you go into the janitor's closet and drown yourself in a mop bucket? 
Bethany drew her hands to her face in shock. You're so hurtful. It's no wonder Herman doesn't love you anymore. She stormed to the rear of the kitchen, weeping loudly and bitterly. Herman was incensed. Are you happy now, you dried out shrew? You're like a disease. You infect everyone you touch. Natalie jumped to her feet, almost toppling the table. She was shaken with hatred and fury. Oh, screw you, Herman! Whatever this has been is over! She stormed from the cafe, stopping and turning after a few steps. And I want my panties back, you freak! When you wear them, you stretch them out! Good! They'll match your face! He roared. Oh, and before I forget... Natalie countered. I faked my orgasms. Me too! Herman yelled. Well, I never... Natalie barked before stomping her way to the front of the bookstore. And with a face like yours, you never will! Herman retorted. Craig, Lorna, and the Reverend exchanged curious and troubled glances. Maybe we should take this outside, Lorna suggested. The air just got heavy in here. Besides, I think there's been way too much sharing going on. Yeah, it's a little uncomfortable, agreed Craig. Uh, I suppose we might ought to lay off the touchy-feely stuff and uh, cut to the chase, uh, Smellum said. He shouted toward the kitchen. Hey, Beth, uh, could you cancel the rest of our order? Just set us up with three of them super chunky chocolate chip cookies to go. I promise I won't bless them. As they congregated in the store's parking lot, Lorna posed the big question. So, will you help us or not? Smellum thought back to the words Craig had shared the day before. Yes, ma'am, I believe I will. Look, this might be the black tar heroin talking, but I think I'm being called on for a purpose. Give me the address, and I'll go by and check things out for myself. If I think this is a spiritual matter, I'll call upon all my years of experience as a pastor and a healer. <clears throat> if I don't think I can help, I'm gonna have to ask y'all to reimburse me for the gas. The deacons have been keeping a closer eye on my receipts since my troubles with the cartels. It's a deal, said Craig. When can you come? The sooner the better. Smellum pulled in an emphysema-laden breath. There's no better time than now. Take me to the boy. Well, okay, Lorna said enthusiastically. Let's put her in the wind. They piled into their respective vehicles and pulled out of the parking lot, each with important thoughts on their minds. Craig. I have hope. Genuine hope. Lorna. I sure hope we know what we're doing. And Smellum. I wonder if I can reach that last bit of joint I dropped on the floorboard. That sucker's got at least one more good toke in it. Please, will you just stop? Maddie begged from the living room. The thrashing, the voices, and the steady drop in temperature were driving her mad. She tried several times to check on Silas after Craig and Lorna went to find an exorcist, but each time she did, the closet door slammed shut in quick succession, and the bulky furniture shifted around, bumping into one another like bumper cars, causing her to flee in terror. The deafening sound filled her ears with pain and horror. The sound was so loud that it echoed through the air. It was like a chorus of ghouls and demons wailing a dark funeral dirge. If hell had a theme song, this would be it. Maddie pressed her hands against her ears. No more! No more! She was sobbing so loudly she didn't notice the heavy knocking on her front door. It took Lorna yelling her name repeatedly before she found the strength to get up and answer it. She felt like a ghost, drifting through a heavy fog her emptiness and exhaustion making her feel weightless. As she opened the door, she was struck by the surprised expressions of the three people in front of her. Oh my God, Maddie, Lorna said. You look awful. Maddie resembled an inmate from a sadistic insane asylum. Her hair was oily, dirty, and uncombed, 
her face devoid of color and emotion. She was still wearing the clothes she had had on from their last visit. An abominable stench emanated from her malnourished, unwashed frame. Moan in, Maddie mumbled robotically. She turned around and shuffled down the hall, her bare feet squeaking as she dragged them along the wooden floor. The haunting cacophony that the monster was performing upstairs was at its highest intensity. An icy tendril of terror snaked its way up the backs of Lorna, Craig, and Smellum. Upon reaching the disheveled living room, the threesome exchanged worried glances as the shell of Maddie Womack dropped to the sofa. Maddie, look at me, Lorna hollered, trying to be heard over the den of the damned. Craig knelt in front of Maddie and held her chilly hands in his. Maddie's vacant eyes peered absently into Craig, as though he weren't there, weren't real. Smellum was paler than usual, less cocky. Sounds like she's got a choir practice going on. We should probably be polite and come back at a more convenient time. His words angered Craig. Are you serious? Do you not hear what's coming out of that bedroom? We gotta do something now before we lose Silas forever. Smellum wasn't expecting this much terror. He was literally shaking in his shoes. This might be the Percocet talking. But I'm in over my head here. Yeah, I think y'all might want to call up one of them Catholic priests who do exorcisms how Target employees ignore customers, regularly and with great passion. Craig rose and went to the sputtering pastor, pressing his nose within an inch of his sweaty face. We ain't got time for that now. But what if that thing tries to kill me? Lorna cut smell him a nasty look. Would you rather deal with me or some crazed monster from the pits of hell? A crazed, a crazed monster, monster from the pits of hell, hell, said Smellum, Craig, and Maddie in unison. All right, Lorna said. Let's get to her then. Uh, before we begin, said Smellum, pulling an ornate flask from the inner pocket of his ill-fitted jacket. Holy water? asked Craig. Mm. <sighs> Fire water said Smellum, taking a long pull of the flask questionable contents. Whoa, Padre, Lorna said. You're sucking that down like a diabetic camel. She grabbed Smellum by the crook of his arm and yanked him up the stairs. Showtime, big boy. Craig turned to Maddie, who looked like a filthy mannequin. Ladies and gentlemen, Maddie has left the building, he thought. He stepped in front of her, put his hand under her chin, and lifted her face. Looking at the husk of his sweet cousin filled his heart with profound sadness and his eyes with tears so heavy they could barely hold them. I swear to you, Maddie, we're going to save Silas. You've lost enough already. You're not losing him, too. <sniffs> Sniffling, he followed Lorna and smell him upstairs. The ear-piercing sounds grew louder as they made their way down the hall to Silas's room. Lorna squinted from the shrill singing, fearful that her ears might bleed. Placing her hand on the doorknob, she braced for the rupture of her eardrums. She quickly twisted the knob. The instant she threw open the door, the horrific sound stopped. Smellum spoke first. Did I just go deaf or did the racket stop? Who wants to go first? Craig whispered from behind them. Whoever goes in there first will probably find themselves in the greatest and most probable danger, Lorna said before shoving Smellum inside the room. Hey! Smellum squealed as he tumbled near the bed's foot. Great googly moogly, I don't want to die. He lifted his flask and doused the air in front of him with its contents. If the spilling of this non-entirely holy liquid, I banish you, evil spirit. He returned the flask to his lips and threw back an enormous swig. <sighs> Same sentiment as before, vile demon. After gulping another shot, he slurred. <sighs> Verily, I say again. Knock it off, you useless souse, yelled Lorna. We got work to do. 
The calm, grinning demon was sitting cross-legged on the bed. Oh, would you look at that? Big girl and little man have returned for more. It watched Snellum as he reluctantly stood up. And they brought a friend too. Craig and Lorna joined Smellum at the end of the bed. You know, I've just about had enough of your ugly face. You were right about us bringing reinforcements. We're here to take you out and bring our baby back. What's he gonna do? The demon chuckled, referring to Smellum. Breathe on me. Smellum felt embarrassed. He hadn't suffered this much shame since the time the deacons had caught him skinny dipping in the baptismal pool. Pushing away the weight of his inadequacies, he locked eyes with the foul creature. Oh, this might be the whippets talking, but you're gonna give us that boy's soul back. I know you ain't scared of me, but you're a coward before the Lord. You tell him, preacher. Although, to be fair, he made a good point about you breathing on him. I know my peepers are sure starting to simmer. The demon laughed. <laughs> you three are pathetic. Leave me. In an instant, he plunged the room into profound darkness, as if someone had flicked off a light switch. The trio felt themselves hurtling uncontrollably through a frigid void of impenetrable darkness. The sensation was disorienting, like being trapped in a vacuum. Suddenly, the motion came to an abrupt stop. Craig screamed, his voice high with panic. Where are we? Lordy, I think he sent us to hell! <laughs> Lorna felt trapped in a tight enclosure, pressed against the other two. She perceived a dank, musty odor and heard metal tinkling on metal. A thought occurred to her. Unless hell has wire hangers and smells like mothballs, we may be a mite closer to home. She proved her point when she reached down and opened the closet door. They each felt a wave of relief when they stepped out into the first floor foyer. <sighs> I know he's of the devil and all, but color me impressed. <clears throat> know what you mean, preacher. I seen this TV special a while back where Penn and Teller made a submarine disappear. Oh, oh! Smellum chirped with childlike excitement. I seen that one too. Say, did you know that Teller can actually talk? I knowed that little feather could talk. He weren't fooling me for a set. Shut up the two of you! Lorna shouted. We got real trouble on our hands if that thing can control us this way. What are we supposed to do to battle that kind of supernatural ability? I think it's time for me to seek some answers by appealing to a higher power. The good lord, I expect? Google! He removed his phone from his pocket and spoke into it. How to defeat demons? As Smellum thumbed the screen, Craig became increasingly anxious. Come on, preacher! How do we do it? Smellum continued scrolling and stopped. This might be it. According to this here article, we gotta use our center and power forward to force the team's will on a... No, wait. It's a basketball article on the Northwestern University Demons. Let's scroll down a bit more. After a couple of swipes, he came to an article on demonic possession which outlined the official protocol employed by the Catholic Church. Okay... Says here that the best thing you can do to thwart a demon is to force it to give you its name. Once you got that, you can compel it to leave the victim's body and return to hell. How are we supposed to do that? That thing ain't only strong, it's clever. We better try something sooner than later, otherwise we'll be out of options. Like hell you will, screamed Maddie, coming back to life. It's not taking my baby, you hear me? It's not taking him anywhere. If y'all are thinking about giving up, then go on. Get out. I'm his mama. Ain't none of y'all that's gonna fight harder than me. Oh, Maddie, croaked Craig. You ain't gonna be doing this alone. We're in this with you. Now come on, y'all. Let's go back up there and show Lucifer's nutsack that he's done ticked off the wrong clan. I'm into that, Lorna exclaimed. 
Smellum lifted his face purposefully towards the heavens. This might be the bath salts talking, but I'm in this till the end as well. Well, that's good enough for me. Thinking of her weak partners, Lorna's head drooped in doubt. <sighs> Saints preserve us. The bedroom door was open when they arrived. No one dared to enter first. I can smell you out there, teased the creature. Smells like fried chicken and fear. Maddie stomped into the room, bold and determined. The Silas monster sat atop the dresser, staring menacingly. Oh, has Mama Bear come back to save her precious widow boy cub? Its sarcasm didn't affect Maddie's demeanor or her courage. That's supposed to upset me? You sound like a pipsqueak playground bully. You're gonna have to do a whole lot better than hurling sticks and stones to get me out this room, you vulgar son of a whore. Maddie's line in the sand amused and empowered the others. Still, they feared that stirring up the powerful creature could bring them more harm. The demon jumped with a squirrel-like agility, bouncing off the ceiling and settled on a chair, giving Maddie an unsettling gaze. Didn't your friends tell you? I can banish all of you from this room on a whim. The rest of the group worried when Maddie walked near the chair and addressed the demon directly. You can banish us from this room a hundred times, and we'll come right back a hundred times to deal with you and your arrogance. The gruesome being stepped off the chair, peered up at Maddie, and bared its rotten teeth, its eyes glowing in the dim light. It extended its arms, and a sickening sound of bones cracking echoed through the air. The skin stretched and strained like elastic, emitting the pungent odor of burning flesh. The sight of the skin tearing apart was both grotesque and fascinating, as if the creature was shedding an old bear. It grabbed Maddie with its spindly fingers and threw her across the room, startling the others. After hitting the wall, she lay motionless but alive. Craig, Lorna, and Smellum were riveted in place by terror as the creature's arms slithered back into place like retracting fire hoses. <laughs> For our remaining customers, we'll be passing out free samples of violence today in our deli. Be sure to stop by and try some. Its face formed a smug smile, assured that it had won. However, what it didn't count on was the rage and commitment that fueled the other three. You sorry sack of snot, yelled Lorna. It's time to drop the mic, cue the sunset, roll the credits, and wait for the blooper reel, cause your butt is done. It was not a supernatural force, but a ticked off redneck trailer trash meanness that Lorna used to propel herself at the demon. She grabbed the grimy creature throwing it on the bed and pinning its shoulders to the stained mattress. She laid haymakers on it that would have made the World Boxing Association proud. Give me your name, you sorry son of a bitch! Give me your name! She yelled with every powerful punch. Give me your name, you sorry SOB! Give me your name! The demon raged and thrashed wildly as the hammy fist continued to rain down upon its face. Lorna wailed louder. I said, give me your dad gum name! Her fury turned into frustration when the hellish ghoul laughed at her. <laughs> it's gonna take more than a couple of trailer park whores to keep me down. <laughs> Craig would not let the creature speak about the two most important women in his life that way. Outrage surged through his veins like liquid fire, his fear turning to fury. I don't know what you demons do in hell, but here in Georgia, if you trash talk to another man's family, you're gonna get a 1,500 square foot double wide two bedroom one bath galley kitchen with a deck off the back beat down. He gripped the thing's ankles. Preacher, do your stuff. Smell him railed against the beast. <sighs> Give me your name, you foul, despicable pawn of Satan. Reveal yourself to me. The demon opened its mouth and the screams of legions of lost souls erupted from its throat. The room shook as the temperature plummeted, frosting the trio's breaths. 
and fogging the window panes. Smellin' proclaimed the name that bends the knee of every angel in heaven and every demon in hell. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to reveal your name, you filthy coward. My name is... The revelation of the demon's lengthy name overwhelms Smellum. I don't suppose there's a nickname you go by? Craig concurred. Dang, I thought Keegan Michael Key was a mouthful. Fed up with everyone, Lorna put a stop to all the nonsense. You listen to me, Mr. Ching Chang Walla Walla Bing Bang, or whatever your dopey name is. You better take leave of this boy's body, or I'm gonna keep on holding you down while Craig pulls up Spotify. That's right. I ain't talking about that Kenny G easy listening style of commercial jazz. I'm talking about that Miles Davis Winton Marsalis crap that sounds like a bunch of tone-deaf amateurs tuning up. The creature fought back harder against its human restraints. In a stronger attempt to free itself, it flew upwards, taking Craig and Lorna with it, colliding with the ceiling. The impact was so intense that the ceiling cracked, sending tiny particles of dust and debris raining down. The overpowering presence held them in place, with a grip so strong that they could feel their bones rattling. It was an overwhelming experience, and they were powerless against it. The Silas creature plummeted to the mattress and glowered at Smellum. Smellum found himself trapped between his faltering faith and the demon before him. His panicked mind drew upon a pivotal scene in the movie The Exorcist when Father Damien invited the demon into his body. Oh, most putrid spawn of Lucifer, leave this child and enter my body. Silas's head thrashed from side to side and his eyes rolled back, revealing only the whites. His body tensed up, his muscles stiffening as the demon spirit violently departed from him. The sound of it leaving was like a deafening screech, as if a thousand nails were being dragged across a chalkboard. Suddenly, Smellum felt his insides burning and melting like candle wax. Vivid images of serpents squirming through pits of fire and hideous creatures clawing at the tortured flesh of the screaming damned invaded his horrified mind, prompting him to yell, Go back to him! Go back to him! When the demon refused, he realized it was up to him to seal the deal. Like Father Damien in the iconic movie scene, he darted across the bedroom and hurled himself at the window. However, instead of bursting through the glass and falling to a long stone staircase below, he splatted against the window like a bug on a windshield. His body squeaked as it slid slowly downward, leaving a gooey trail of spit and snot. Whoops, Craig said from his spot on the ceiling. Guess he wasn't aware of the city code that all second-story windows have to be made of tempered glass. Silas let out a blood-curdling scream as the demon's sinister black spirit slithered its way into his vulnerable soul yet again. The putrid stench of sulfur filled his nostrils, and the palpable sensation of the twisted entity made his skin crawl with fear. <laughs> the sound of its menacing laughter echoed in his mind, sending shivers down his spine. The feeling of its icy grip on his soul left him gasping for air making him unable to break free from its grasp. Well, well, I guess that just about does it. Say goodbye to Silas. He won't be coming back. Without warning, Maddie threw herself at the demon, pulling him to her bosom in a fierce hug. Maddie, no! Lorna yelled, thrashing to free herself. Maddie ignored her warning. Silas, Mama loves you. I remember the day you were born. My heart was so full, I thought it might burst. Stunned, the demon struggled to free itself from Maddie's embrace. Don't listen to her, boy. She's lying. You mean nothing to her. Shut up, you filth. Silas, you're the rock that I cling to. The love that keeps me alive. Baby, if you can hear Mama come back to me, fight this thing. A strong wailing wind engulfed the room, producing a cyclone of sound. 
This is your fault, Silas. You're the reason your father left. The monster cried in desperation. That's not true, baby. He left because he's weak and selfish. This is about you and me. I love you, sweetie. I need you in my life. Maddie pulled Silas to the floor, embracing him more fully. She squeezed her eyes shut in fervent prayer. God, please bring my baby back to me. I don't care anymore about all the other pain. Just please, Father, let me have my boy back. The room warmed and brightened to where everyone shielded their eyes for fear of going blind. It was like staring into the sun. No, you can't have him, the demon shouted, its cracking voice full of anguish. <sighs> Give him back to me. Maddie hugged her son's body tighter. In the name of the Lord, go to hell, you nasty monster! Suddenly, the hellish wind died, the brilliant light diminished, and the room fell silent. Lorna and Craig dropped from the ceiling, landing on the mattress with a loud sprawling. <laughs> what just happened? Love brought him back to me, Maddie replied. It didn't take any potions or incantations. It only took a reminder that God's love can never be taken without our permission. <sighs> Came the voice from below the window. Uh, what's going on? Am I dead? Now, preacher, said Craig, you're still among the living. Maddie here saved the day. Silas coughed. <laughs> Mama, is that you? Maddie's face lit up with a long, absent smile. Yeah, darling, it's me. How you feeling? I'm tired, but good. I had a nightmare. I dreamed I was in a dark place. I kept calling for you, but you didn't answer. At least not at first. But then I heard you shouting at somebody, demanding they let me go. Next thing I knew, here I was. He yawned, stretching his overworked body. Can I have some ice cream? I'm really hungry. Maddie's eyes glistened with tears of elation as she basked in the moment. Yes, baby. You can have all the ice cream you want. Silas looked around the room. What's Craig and Lorna doing here? And who's that fella sitting on the floor? They're the people who helped bring you back from that awful place. Smellum stood, shaking the fog from his head. Hi there, Silas. I'm the right Reverend Ronnie Don Smellum from Buttermilk Bible Chapel, where sin is a... Silas, Craig interjected. The important thing is that as a family, we can overcome anything. Whether it's your daddy's foolishness or the devil himself, nothing can break our bond. Maddie gathered Silas, and they all went downstairs to revel in their hard-fought victory over the darkness. Then they had some ice cream. They stood in the driveway exchanging hugs, along with promises that they'd stay in touch more often. On the porch, Silas sat quietly, his heart heavy with thoughts of the love and laughter that had departed with his lowly father, only to be returned in abundance. I want to thank y'all for what you've done today, Maddie said to Craig and Lorna. You two sure make a great team. Yeah, said Lorna. He's good at creating fiascos, and I'm good at solving them. Craig refused to be outdone. And I'm good at kicking tail, while Lorna here is good at numbers. The numbers to Domino's, the numbers to Jimmy John's. That's enough, Craig. The number to Grubhub. Craig, I said that's enough. The number to DoorDash. Craig's ill-advised name game came to an immediate stop when he received, free of charge of course, the slap heard round the world. Ah. There's another number I know, Dung Drip. 911. Want me to call it? Y'all are too much sometimes, chimed Maddie. She looked caringly at Silas. You know, I used to curse God for all the terrible heartbreaking things that haunted me. Now I'm grateful. Grateful because he showed me that happiness ain't about having what you want. It's about wanting what you have. All I ever needed to heal me was right here all alone. Craig kissed Maddie's forehead and pulled it to his own. Never forget that you got us too. As long as we're together, 
Not even the powers of hell can touch us, Lorna said, joining the two. Smellum looked on, taking care to keep a respectful distance from the family circle. Okay, then, Craig said. It's time for everything to get back to normal. We'll see you and Silas next week. Then, looking at Silas, yelled, And there'll be plenty of ice cream. Wouldn't miss it for the world, replied Maddie. Then she went to smell him and hugged him. Silas wasn't the only one who got healed today, was he? Smell him remained silent. There was no bragging to be done. Lordy, I better get home and take care of El Superbo, said Craig. There ain't no telling what he's been into whilst we were gone. He slid inside the old truck's trashy cab and shouted a last message. Okay, y'all. Smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. Ain't that what that weirdo on the podcast always says? Lorna asked, walking to the pumpkin car. He ain't no weirdo. How would you know? Cause I'm a weirdo, and I ain't never seen him at the meetings. Lorna stood next to her festive heap taking time to criticize Craig's. I'll wait and make sure that old rusty monstrosity of yours cranks. When are you going to trade that old Chevy truck in for something nicer like a Cadillac Escalade? Woman, there ain't no way I'm ever trading in my Chevy for a Cadillac. Whatever, said Lorna. Once Lorna and Craig had left, Maddie took advantage of the opportunity to thank Smellum privately. Reverend Smellum, I can't thank you enough for what you done for us. We're going to have to start coming to your church. Like it or not, you're a part of our lives now. She kissed him on the cheek, joined Silas, and went inside the house, leaving Smellum to bask in the afternoon sunlight. Smellum lingered for a while, then went to his new used car and performed a laborious ritual required to open the driver's side door. Before climbing in, he rested his arms on the car's roof and gazed at the puke green house. Smiling broadly, he touched his cheek. Gotcha, he hissed. And that was Craig's Demon by author P.D. Williams, a good reminder of the strong and enduring bond of family. And we're all family here, aren't we? That's why I'd like to tell you about a brand new audiobook from tonight's featured author, which has certainly become a family affair. It's a collection of PD stories narrated by myself, Jeff, Paul J. McSorley, and a few names you may or may not know. Either way, it's a great book, and we'd all be honored to share a spot on your virtual bookshelves. It's called Dark House, Many Rooms. You can find it on Amazon, in Kindle, and on Audible.com for the audiobook. Check the show notes up there for a link, and thanks for all your support. A little about the author. P.D. Williams is an author of short horror fiction, composer of music, and prolific eater of barbecue. For more info on P.D., visit him at pdwilliamsauthor.com. Also, after a good amount of arm-twisting and persistent noogies, he finally got on Facebook. You can find them at P.D. Williams Horror Rider. Thanks as always, P.D. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm a 
afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. I know you need one after all those ad spots, but just remember, how am I supposed to keep giving you free drinks without ad spots? Exactly. A big hello and thank you again for all my patrons. And if you haven't become a patron yet, make sure you go to patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood to become a patron and get access to extra content and the crazy ass talk show that we call the Drew and Jeff Show. And apparently Paul J. McSorley is part of the crew now too. <laughs> I don't know how these things happen. So may the wind be at your back and may the road rise up to meet you. Remember, Robitussin cures most, but love cures all. And as long as we're getting all sentimental here, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, my friends. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.